Welcome, and thank you for joining us. The last time I did a Notre Dame launch for one of my books, it was held at the Institute for Latino Studies' previous home, McKenna Hall. Were it not for the pandemic, we'd be meeting in our new home, Bond Hall. When it became clear that this book launch would be virtual, I decided to turn it into an opportunity to invite a few writer friends. I hope it will become clear to you as the evening unfolds what ethos I'm aiming for. One of the pleasures of directing Letras Latinas, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago here in this space, thanks to the good folks of Red Hen Press, is working with Notre Dame students who demonstrate a keen interest in collaboration and enriching the cultural life of our campus community. Misael Osorio Conde, a second year MFA candidate in poetry, who's beside me on your screen right now, is one such individual. Last year, when I asked if he'd be open to conducting an oral history interview with visiting poet Juan J. Morales, as well as introducing Juan at his public reading, he embraced the opportunity. My hope in these matters is that the preparation leading up to these gestures of literary journalism are enriching for the student in question. In Misael's case, I think I have my answer. This fall, Misael decided to teach the poetry of Juan J. Morales in his Intro to Poetry Writing workshop. When I learned of this, Letras Latinas gladly arranged for Juan to visit Misael's class via Zoom which is another way of saying we were able to pay Juan an honorarium, which brings me to another point I never tire of making, enhancing the education of our students by bringing living writers into Notre Dame classrooms, virtual or otherwise, would not be possible without the generosity of our individual donors. When I conceived of tonight's event, it also occurred to me that someone should probably introduce me I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to Misael for agreeing to do so and, no less meaningful, for agreeing to share with us a sampling of his own poetry. Please welcome Misael Osorio Conde. Thank you, Francisco. Greens in orange groves. One, how you blooming of carbon I am after all. Only direction matters to the poet when he crossed the crossing out of his memoir, forgot to dispose of his gloves. Later, I will go on to tell them how even, though my tin for water was filled with ash, I still had to drink that warming solution to talk with the critters. But back to the poet, his eyes assemble on the ground in the shape of arrows pointed towards the southern sea. Before he breathed his last, it had been centuries perhaps since he had walked on all fours, carrying buckets of night back to his village. Or was it his parents' village? Mine still were children then, if my count amounts to anything, resembling the fall of TV drops. When the soldier with his dog chased them past the hill, he never had a chance. Forgive me though, I don't have access to these places. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us in the celebration of Francisco Aragon's After Ruben. Let me by begin by acknowledging what a privilege it is to be invited to share this stage with such talented crew of writers for the launch of a fantastic poetry collection. In his foreword to After Ruben, Michael Doughty aptly observes how Francisco's latest collection imagines durable, graceful forms of belonging and how the article mine in the title to the prose piece, My Ruben, doesn't entail ownership, but rather denotes a tradition, as well as an intimate way to be sure, a gift, meal, a story, hug, a kind word, a poem. To this list, I will add a stage, because to experience after Ruben is to join in, in a poetry festival where Ruben Darío headlines the event Francisco has curated a stage where Ernesto Cardinal, Leticia Hernández Linares, Susan Howe, Andrés Montoya, just to name a few, 
come to perform, celebrate poetry, and become family. The first time I was invited to share a stage with Francisco, I had just arrived from Southern California to join the creative writing program at Notre Dame, where he directs Letras Latinas, and from where he was organizing the One Poem Festival, Writers for Migrant Justice. At this reading, I was struck by Francisco's generosity, because although he was the one, he was the event organizer, he was the only poet that chose not to read his own work. Instead, and in a similar approach to the one he uses in After Ruben, he paid homage to the late Francisco X. Alarcón by reading Alarcón's poem, Carta a America, and in this way making the reading in effect a dialogue not just with the living, but a collaboration with those voices no longer with us. Another way to appreciate the collaborative aspect of Francisco's poetic practice is in his approach to translation. By riffing, as he calls it, on the work of Ruben Darío, he is collaborating in the production of a more inclusive poetic body, a more humane translation of poetics, if you will. In this way, when one considers the liberties Francisco took to handle the poetic body of Darío's work, we can appreciate a deep sense of intimacy. For instance, Take the radical approach in rendering one of my favorite riffs in the collection, Darius Invierno, not just transforming it from its sonnet form, but where the original is addressed to a fictional Carolina, Francisco's Winter Hours opens with an imperative to look at him. Amado wakes, smiles. When Aragon visited my introduction to poetry writing class, he explained the level of intimacy involved in his translation practice and invited students to approach translation as a collaboration with the original source. Back to the week when Francisco invited me to share the stage at that writers for my own justice reading. The larger significance of that gesture is that he not only made sure that I understood that we are peers, but he opened the doors to the Institute for Latino Studies and in effect provided me with a home away from home. Returning to the stage metaphor, a stage is not a home, but neither is after Ruben just a stage. In this collection's poems, translations, and essay, Francisco offers us an intimate familiar space, a home. In an echo to, to his statement in his prose piece, My Ruben, you might say then that my mother's favorite Ruben Darius poem had become part of her DNA, her bread, something she passed on to me. It is an honor for me to introduce Francisco Aragon as he passes on to us part of his literary DNA, his bread. Welcome, Francisco. Thank you, Misael. The summer of 2004 saw me take a leave of absence to help care for my oldest sister in Northern California who was battling breast cancer. During those months, I put together a proposal for the University of Arizona Press for an anthology that would gather 25 Latinx voices. In my quest to learn of additional poets to consider, I came across a gem of a book, Between the Heart and the Land, Latina Poets in the Midwest. One of the volume's contributors and co-editor was Brenda Cardenas. I was so taken by her intralingual work that in addition to inviting her to form part of the Arizona anthology, I also invited her to publish a chapbook with Momotombo Press, which appeared in 2005. From the Tongues of Brick and Stone, a chapbook that included the visual art of Jeff Abbey Maldonado, sold extremely well and was adopted in a number of classrooms. I recently did a search for it and discovered one can purchase it as a collectible for $115. <laughs> in 2009, I'd tell anyone who would listen that Boomerang, Brenda's first full-length book with an introduction by Juan Felipe Herrera, was the poetry book of the season. One of my favorite pieces is titled, Report from the Temple of Confessions, in old Chicano English. In 2010, Letras Latinas partnered with Kaveh Khanum and Brenda 
was designated as guest poet at their week-long summer workshop. One of the highlights was watching Brenda bond with the Kaveh Kanem community. She sold all 50 copies of Boomerang that she had brought with her. At the conclusion of our time with that special community, Brenda and I spent an additional week as writers in residence in North Pittsburgh on Samsonia Way as guests of City of Asylum. Each day, we'd retreat into our own wing of the house they put us up in to work on whatever project was occupying us. At meal times, we'd come together to break bread. In the evenings, we'd venture out to discover local eateries that piqued our interest. In 2012, Brenda, in her capacity as Milwaukee's first poet laureate, invited a number of Latinx poets to read at the public library downtown and hosted us along with poet Roberto Harrison in her home for a memorable after party. In the winter of 2014, Brenda, along with poet Valerie Martinez, co-taught the inaugural Pintura Palabra workshop a workshop that she and Valerie designed themselves at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. In addition, she and Valerie gave a terrific presentation at the Library of Congress on ekphrastic poetry, which one can access online. I'll wind this down by saying that I'm happy to announce that Brenda's long awaited second book, which is whose working title is Trace, is in the queue at Red Hen Press. Trace will inaugurate a curated series as part of the Letras Latinas Red Hen Collaborative. Please join me in welcoming Brenda Cardenas. Thank you so much, Francisco. I can't just, everything Francisco just said um, uh, sh shows how much of a force he's been in my life as a poet, um, and in many of our lives, I always call him a champion for Latinx le liter liter letters or literature. Um, and um, I have been um, the beneficiary of a lot of his work and have loved the experiences that I've had working with him. So I'm so happy to be celebrating um, uh, the appearance of After Ruben, the publication of After Ruben. Um, I'm going to read three poems and then talk to you about one of Francisco's poems. The first poem I'm going to read is an ekphrastic poem um, that is based on the um, work of Eric de Luna Henel, a Mexican uh, artist who has a series called Cien Nombres para la Muerte, or 100 Names for Death. And this poem is based on the three uh, drawings that I believe you'll see on your screen. Um, from Cien Nombres para la Muerte, Las Jodidas, the screwed ones. We are bent from the loads we've carried, strapped to our bony backs, sacks of maize, yerbas, frijoles, bundles of firewood, jerry jugs of precious agua. Each Saturday, we haul tall stacks of caged birds to the mercado to sell their captive songs, their laments our heaviest burden. Hobble a mile in our ragged huaraches, holes in their tire tread soles. Follow us to the village of whispers, where the only gritos belong to the wind, empty doorways grown over with weeds, our men's dusty boots waiting years for their return. Look into the cenotes of our eyes. You'll find no fish, no flores, no monedas, only sacrifices with their mouths full of mud and the dread of our itchy grins. Then tell us you would never risk wrapping your little lamb in a rebozo, grabbing your withered staff and heading north Devil sun, scorpion, migra be damned. You'd fly for the birds whose latches you could not unlock, 
you'd fly, so the only satchel your daughter hoists on her shoulders is heavy with libros, lapices, y sueños. You'd fly, never believing they would wrest her from your back and lock her in a cage. And um, the second poem that I would like to read to you um, is called Sweet Sixteen. And I just wanna give a shout out to um, the new anthology that came out called Grabbed, um, Writers on Sexual Assault, which was co-edited by a number of um, writers, including Richard Blanco. And this poem is in that anthology, Sweet Sixteen. Sweet Sixteen and patched Levi jeans and spaghetti strap tees, we walked a mile to meet the bad boys kicking back at the park. Newports nearly tumbling from their bottom lips as they flicked wheels to flint and waited for a spark. We strolled in with six packs of Pabst and Sass, asking for a joint and a motorcycle ride, secretly wishing for a date to the carnival or concert or next beer bash. But we barely popped the tops of our cans, had any chance to joke or flirt or speak of summer plans before dusk deepened to dark, before he pressed me against tree bark, tightened his vice of a body to mine and grew 10 hands that grabbed everywhere, even the hair at the back of my head to stop my thrashing neck. By some dumb luck, he could not trap the 10 alarm screech, its siren rupturing his will. Still, I often wake straining and mute, knowing either he or the tree will swallow me if I cannot scream. And what of her? The one who breezed into the park with me that summer eve, all cherry lip gloss and glitter eyes, all cool facade melting on the inside, all sweet 16 with her firefly heart waiting to spark. And my last poem, this poem is titled Coco Pie Road. I jot down directions my mother-in-law gives us to drive from the dark ocean road that harbors her beach house to a buzzed up blaze of highway. As my husband steers, I keep my eyes peeled and worn. She said to turn left on Coco Pie Road. He throws his head back and laughs. Concord Pike. My mother-in-law's accent is my grandfather's, permitting me to taste just a little bit of beer on a sweltering August day. I close my eyes and wish to wake at a painted rainbow with, big, with a big red arrow pointing down Coco Pie Road, where the ocean tastes like coconut cream and bakeries await us on every corner. Not only do they serve the sweetest pies, but they build sandwiches, just like my father pronounced them, on hard rolls with jamón, lettuce, y tomate. If you criticized my mother's cooking or wronged her in any way, you were an ass pipe, no wipe nearby to clean the caca off your nose. And although I kept so many of their lessons and words piled on the formica table of my inner kitchen with stacks of tortillas, I learned to make sandwiches they spit e vinegar, to swear bilingually, no me chingues, ass pipe, and took pride in my mispronunciation of Catholicism while I dodged Sunday school in parks and alleys. My mother prophesied that this would ruin my life because God encompasses everything, but little does she know that at the fork I turned left down Coco Pie Road and it smells like chocoatl spiced with chile y vanilla frothy drink of the gods. So thank you for um, hearing my poems. And I just wanted to um, talk about one of Francisco's poems um, that I'm going to ask him to read in After Ruben. Um, which is just a, an amazing book, a beautiful book. Um, the poem that I selected uh, for Francisco to read is one that he dedicated to his mother. Jugglers layers multiple meanings, literal and metaphorical, onto the act of juggling, 
street performers literally juggling fire, an eldest son trying to handle two large lit candles as he plays with his sisters in the dark, and an immigrant woman juggling motherhood, a tiring sewing job, night school to learn English, and aspirations for a better job. One of the things I admire most about the poem is Francisco's ability to subtly build this nuanced metaphor inside of a narrative. Another is how he handles time and flashback in the poem, how seamlessly he moves between the poem's present action when the mother, who has just turned 50, and son are watching performers juggle fire and the mother's memory of a time when her children left alone for only a few minutes almost burned down the house. Finally, I love how the poem imparts both the wonder in the spectacle of fire and the danger implicit in it. Um, it's one of many just beautiful, stunning poems in the collection. And so Francisco, will you please read Jugglers to us? Thank you, Brenda. Jugglers. She and I on a bench, peeling prawns. The first day of her 50th year, and she points at street performers about to juggle fire. And a distant summer morning surfaces afloat on the light wind blowing off the bay. Older sisters in the dark hiding as big brother parades around the house, his hands outstretched, clutching large candles. I'm on a search, he shouts, marching from room to room till he finds them huddling in a jungle of clothes, beacons flickering as flame hot wax begins to flow across his fingers. While she is walking to Centro Adulto, her head brimming with phrases, the words she needs so she can quit sewing, land a job in a bank. And the sitter, arriving minutes late, finding us wet and trying to save a coat, a shirt, a dress, it's a small one, nothing the green hose and frantic assembly line of buckets doesn't eventually douse, leaving walls and curtains the color of coal. Mira, she gasps, her left hand wrapping my shoulder, still pointing with the right as the torches from one juggler to the other begin to fly. Buenas noches. November 16th, 2003 was a Sunday. Rigoberto Gonzalez and I were slated to read at the Cornelia Street Cafe in the West Village. The event was spearheaded by Terra Incognita, a dual language journal whose editors resided in Brooklyn and Madrid. That night, Rigo and I would meet for the first time and read with Urayoan Noel. From this vantage point, it remains one of a handful of readings that I consider the most meaningful. Two years later, Urayoan and I became first book press mates, my Puerta del Sol to his cool logic, La Logica Cool. March 31st, 2006 was a Friday when we shared joint billing at the Arizona International Latino Arts Festival. During those few days in Tempe, I remember doing an oral history interview with our recently dearly departed Gary Keller, founder and publisher of Bilingual Press. And I remember Ura sharing with me the odyssey of another trip he'd made to Tempe, that time with his band, 
to record the CD that would accompany Cool Logic, La Logica Cool. October 4th, 2007 was a Thursday when I had the pleasure of being the interviewer and conducted an oral history session with Urayawan here on the Notre Dame campus. He, along with fellow poet Lydia Torres, were gracing us with their presence, with their wordplay. Once, I forget the year, I met up with Uda and Lydia near Harlem for lunch at this now forgotten hole in the wall. It wasn't long after that that Letras Latinas established a presence in Washington, D.C. I connected with another Puerto Rican poet, Naomi Ayala, who was one of the organizers of a Spanish language series called Para Eso La Palabra, which was held at the annex of the Folger Shakespeare Library. Ura Yawan was kind enough to board a bus in the Bronx and trek down to D.C. to be the featured poet in that series. Afterwards, we all piled into a nearby Greek restaurant for a late, late dinner. By now, I hope you're getting the picture. Ura and I go back nearly 20 years. Once at a Latinx conference in New York, the poet critic Michael Dowdy, in private conversation, opined that Ura's book, Buzzing Hemisphere, Rumor Hemisferico, would require critics to come up with a new lexicon to do justice to this innovative work. The previous year, he'd published his groundbreaking tome of literary scholarship, Invisible Movement, New Yorican Poetry from the 60s to Slam. You see, Urayawan Noel is one of our community's premier poet critics. Let's fast forward, October 12th. 2018, a Friday, on the campus of Northwestern. I'm at a mini conference called A Celebration of Mandorla to honor the dual language journal, which, like Terra Incognita, had binational editorship in the United States and Mexico, respectively. I had the pleasure of seeing and reading with Ura and others. And now that pleasure befalls me once again. Please welcome Urayawan Noel. Gracias, Francisco, for the beautiful, generous introduction. Fractal. Disyllabic tears a rima for a love that multiplies. We land on some point scanned far from our mind. Freedom a kind not yet defined. You bet it sounds like wet deep grounds in caves with mounds of graves whose words night saves. Dead birds will sing. Lost herds, I'll bring you home. Wellspring, rhizome, bone beach we comb to reach the pus in each of us. Remote, we're thus afloat in time. A coat of grime, my dear. Let's rhyme the fear away with queer dismay and joy today. Fractal. Tercetos encadenados bisílabos para un amor múltiple. Somos viejos tomos, quejos de lejos. Me dices que grises, quieren lices, mueren. Nos hieren los dioses, dos voces graves, toses, aves muertas, sabes ciertas fallas, puertas, hallas tus playas. Pus hecha luz, mecha sin fecha, fin menos ruin, plenos ríos, truenos, bríos, tuyos, míos. Sin queens. Anti-imperial 
Lear, animal canto era, decolonial verse solo, primer, interior fresco, mar no vital sauce, taller solar cultivar, do come, paces, habitable arena, transversal me, he, tornado, revolver, terror, rival, no, red atlas, relieve grave sin, alas, tender, radical, disparate seas, surge, sin quienes, anti-imperial, leer, animal canto era, decolonial, verse solo, primer, interior fresco, mar no vital sauce, taller solar, cultivar, do come, pases, habitable arena transversal, me he tornado revolver, terror, rival, no, red, atlas, relieve, grave, sin alas, tender, radical, disparate seas, surge. Ideal. No somos nada, pero aquí juntos. Francisco X. Alarcón. Nadie se te parece. Tal vez es que te convierto en demasiada cosa o algo así. La mayor fuente energética o primer fósil. Nadie habla. Solo te miro con mi cara de guerrero perdido. Ideal. We are nothing but here together. Francisco X. Alarcón. No one looks like you. Maybe I make you out to be too much of a thing. The strongest energy source or first fossil. No one speaks. I just watch you like a lost warrior would. And this is my statement on Francisco, which I'll do in poetic form. This poem, este poema, lo voy a transcribir. I'm going to transcribe it as soon as I get home, tan pronto llegue a casa. And it will become a print text. Y se volverá un texto impreso. And unless I put this up somewhere online, y a menos que ponga esto en línea en algún lado, nobody will know. Nadie sabrá, unless they're reading carefully, a menos que lean cuidadosamente, and what does that even mean? ¿Qué quiere decir eso? These days en estos días, that this began as a smartphone improvisation, que esto comenzó como una improvisación en el teléfono móvil, y que por ende, and that therefore, es una traición, it's a traducing, it's a displacement, es una translación, una traslado de sentido, displacement of meaning from the beginning, desde el comienzo. It's transcription. Su transcripción. It's eruption on the page. Su erupción en la página. A mere afterthought. Casi dado por sentado. So translation cannot be easily disentangled from remediation. Y pues la traducción no se puede desenmarañar de la remediación. And what if we added that translation is embodiment? Y qué si añadiéramos que la traducción es un volverse cuerpo. 
devolviéndonos al cuerpo, returning us to the body. Think of Ansaldúa, pensemos en Ansaldúa, fighting off the guards, sacándose de encima a los sentinelas. Her only weapon, su única arma, la agudeza, the wit that lets her undo logical borders, fronteras lógicas. I say all this to mean, digo todo esto para constatar, para preguntar, to ask, what are translations, bodies that matter? ¿Cuáles son los cuerpos que importan de la traducción? What are its antibodies? ¿Cuáles son sus anticuerpos? What is its antimatter? ¿Cuál es su antimateria? What is its center? ¿Cuál es su centro? ¿Cuál es su periferia? What is its periphery? ¿Cuál es su barrio? What is its neighborhood? And what is its hemisphere? ¿Y cuál es su hemisferio. And all this has to do, now the improvisation that I transcribed is over, and the live one, quote unquote, begins. I chose a poem by Francisco called, Because They Lived Abroad, Who's They? Think of Neruda, Vallejo, Nervo, Abroad, think of Paris, think of New York, think of those other Latin Americas, think of those queer geographies of desire, displaced, queer as in intimacy, but also queer as in radicality. A poetics of collage, a poetics of seduction, that's what Francisco does in After Ruin. And we are after him, lo seguimos, we follow him, and he will follow us en los círculos concéntricos de esa poética del afterhood, And I mentioned that Francisco amplifies Latinx voices. So let's amplify Francisco. If we can, buy after Ruben. Compren el libro, buy a copy. No se lo pierdan, es importante. A shameless plug, yes, but if you don't plug your books shamelessly, they're not going to sell. We know that as poets. Besides, Shamelessness is part of that radical queer poetics that resists all conventional <laughs> translation. Its only nation is in a radical performativity that Francisco brings to the archive. He'll tell us more about it. But for now, I leave you in bel queer form with Francisco. Aragón, because they live abroad. Gracias. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ura. The poem I want to read to you has an epigraph by Susan Howe, which reads, to write about a loved author would be to follow the trails he follows because they lived abroad. Or Rubens' Parisian phase, how during those nine months he and Amaro shared an apartment in Montmartre, Rue du Faubourg. Their all-consuming flesh, their melancholy Exile stood where Vallejo would, the melancholia of Darío, Nervo, Vallejo. Between them shared what they lacked. We track our own desire. That soul is content, paradox, as in those lines that still pulsing beneath the skin, y no saber a donde vamos, ni de donde venimos. Because they lived abroad, I was away for years. What meaning is there in my head, these names? Free as oceans, bottles are what they are, another kind of mirror material for a start. Consider all of this an excursus on 
origins, trace of the word Lugad. I will inhabit a place that doesn't exist. Hay golpes en la vida tan fuertes, yo no sé. Managua is Madrid. In 1998, I concluded my 10-year residence in Spain. I did so because I wanted to form part of a community in the context of grad school. It was at UC Davis while pursuing a degree in creative writing that I met Maria Melendez Kelson. I remember she brought to our first workshop together a beautiful elegy to Matthew Shepard. And I remember our workshop instructor declaring in his beautiful, in his distinct voice, declaring the poem, a noble failure. <laughs> I think that was the expression he used. <laughs> Gary Snyder, another poet we studied with during our time there, would go on, on the other hand, to write a glowing introduction to Maria's chapbook length selection of poems in Momotombo Press's inaugural volume, Mark My Words, Five Emerging Poets. In 2003, after I'd settled in at the Institute for Latino Studies at Notre Dame, Maria would begin her stint across the road at St. Mary's College, first as a fellow at the Center for Women's Intercultural Leadership, and then as an assistant professor of English. In 2006, we joined forces, she with Quill at St. Mary's, me with the ILS at Notre Dame, to co-coordinate with funding from the National Endowment for the Arts, Letras Latinas' first multidisciplinary initiative, Poetas y Pintores, Artists Conversing with Verse, a traveling 24-piece exhibit featuring 12 Latinx poets and 12 Latinx visual artists which had its grand opening at the Moreau Galleries at St. Mary's. Maria would eventually move on to start a new job at Utah State, but our paths would inv invariably cross at semi-regular intervals, including over breakfast whenever we both coincided at AWP. In 2007, she would return to South Bend alongside the poet Stephen Cordova to help me launch the Wind Shifts Anthology at the home of the ILS's founding director, Gil Cardenas. She and Stephen would interview each other for our oral history project. Another memorable time was in East LA at Self Help Graphics, which was one of the stops of the Poetas y Pintores exhibit. And later again, circa 2009, in Logan, Utah, when the exhibit made its way to Utah State, thanks to her initiative. Her poetry, brilliant in its engagement of echo poetics, has been a staple in my Latinx poetry curriculum. And she would return once again in the fall of 2013 for the final stop of Latino Poetry Now, a multi-year initiative that kicked off in 2011 at Harvard and concluded at Notre Dame. Joining her were the poets Blas Falconer, Reina J. Leon, and John Murillo. It was during that visit that she and I recorded a video conversation on the 10-year history of Momotombo Press, for which she served as poetry editor. In fact, it was Maria who worked with Brenda on from the tongues of brick and stone. These days, after authoring two splendid books of poetry, Maria is moving into the territory of mystery fiction, which we'll all be able to sample shortly. Literary friendships with an emphasis on friendship are a precious thing. Please join me in welcoming Maria Melendez Kelson. 
Thank you so much, Francisco. It's been 22 years and counting uh, that we've been friends. So I'm just thrilled to be here celebrating your book and I'm thrilled to be in the company of the other writers who are here today as well. I love all your work and I'm so glad to get to know Misael and his work as well. I'm going to do a product placement moment. Uh, Uda's plug was brilliant, musical, rhythmic. Here's the visual. As Uda said, buy the book, buy the book, buy this book that Francisco wrote. And I'm so happy to be celebrating it today. Um, Francisco very generously set up this event for each of the guests to read a little of their work. So I am going to do that uh, for just a few quick minutes and then I'm going to um, break with the format a little bit after I read my excerpt. So stay tuned for something a little different there. All right, so the excerpt I'm going to read here is from uh, the novel in progress that I'm working on. It's a, a mystery novel set in Northern California, a contemporary mystery. Um, the subgenre is amateur sleuth. So the uh, main character who's the speaker here, um, uh, she uh, actually doesn't begin with her as the speaker, but she is trying to find out who um, murdered a former student of hers. She runs a school in Humboldt County and she had to come to what's basically a stash house in Eureka, California, where um, an unscrupulous, unethical um, employer is keeping um, his workers, his mostly undocumented workers in substandard housing. So she's come to this place to um, interview them and see if she can find out anything about the death of this boy, Armando. She has to solve Armando's murder because her son is at the moment the prime suspect. So she comes to the door of this. It's an old church that's been converted to this stash house basically. And she's uh, talking to one of the one of the men she was looking for. So it starts with his voice, actually. He says, you're talking to Frankie. I'm his crew leader. He come to work very tired, working slowly. He almost cut my arm with pruning shears. We work early, but all night he's with girls. What are you talking about? I asked Frankie. Tuesday? Yes, Tuesday. Also Monday, every day. It was hard to believe Tuesday had just been yesterday. Just yesterday, Armando started his day getting chewed out by his crew leader. Then he'd gone home to get ready for school. Then he'd been killed. Do you know anything about what happened to Armando? I asked. Nando, he said. I nodded. He's deported. The man calling himself Frankie stamped his foot as he said the words. Deported, I asked. I tried to cover my surprise. Then I think you need a lawyer, you and whoever else lives here. I work with immigrant families. I support them. I can help. Braulio Tenorio helps us. We have all our papers. Because of Senor Tenorio? Yes, because of Tenorio. What if someone makes him mad? No one does, miss. No one makes him mad. Valen nuestras vidas. Either the man in front of me knew Armando had been killed, but didn't want to tell me, or Tenorio lied to Armando's work crew about why he hadn't shown up for work. Whichever way it went, someone wanted the murder hidden. I pushed at Frankie's hip to move aside so that I could come in. He shrank from my hand as though it burned him. I pushed the door open, calling, Jose Lara, are you here? I have to talk to you. I crossed the tiny entryway in two steps. An unlit space that had once been the sanctuary stood bare except for a kitchenette in one corner. Nothing moved but the dust motes. Apparently no one considered the hollering of a gringa as a summoning bell. I have empanadas, I called. Pumpkin, pineapple, cherry, calabaza, piña y... I couldn't remember the word for cherry. A soft scuffle came from the ceiling above my head. Oh my God, lady, now I really know you're not migra. Frankie's voice came from behind me, chuckling. Nobody from La Migra coming in like that with empanadas. 
like cheese for a mousetrap. I don't know who you are. Don't know what you want, but okay. We we'll listen to you for fun only. I smiled a half smile, wanting to be offended, but lacking the energy. Okay, por abajo, the young man yelled to the ceiling. Abajo, abajo. A dark corner of the ceiling swung open and a ladder slid down to the wood floor of the former church. One man came down the ladder, then another, another. I counted 23 of them in all, including Frankie. They were an assemblage of boys, really, anywhere from 14 to 20 something years old. The tallest stood at about my nose height, but most didn't reach my shoulder. In old t-shirts and flannel, they swirled around me like a soft creek eddying around a fallen branch. A fragrance of grass cuttings, cologne, motor oil, and anxiety haloed the young male bodies. They also emitted an articulate silence rich with questions. A few spoke softly to each other while keeping their eyes on me. I caught some Spanish, gabacha, foreigner, caridad, charity, and heard all their syllables I could only guess at. I felt disoriented, like I had awoken in a strange fairy tale, light brown and the 24 campesinos. There was nothing but bakery items for currency, hoping the act of having taken a life or knowledge of a life taken would leave a ripple in the air around someone. Thank you for the chance to share a little bit of that prose. And now we come back to poetry, but we're breaking with form. Instead of asking Francisco to read a piece, I'm going to read a piece of Francisco's myself. And the reason I'm breaking with form is that I've been uh, giving poetry readings with uh, Francisco over these several decades. And one of the things that I have heard him mention repeatedly, which deserves repeating because it's so interesting, is a notion he got from his mentor, one of his mentors at University of California, Berkeley, where he was an undergrad. And that notion is that a poem is not fully realized, not a fully realized work of art, until it is uttered aloud by someone other than the author. This notion comes from Robert Pinsky, who Francisco worked with at Cal Berkeley. And uh, he shared early on in our workshops that uh, Pinsky emphasized poetry as a bodily art. I think Ura Yohan's reading was a great example of that, of poetry being a physical experience because it comes through someone's body and it enters someone else's body through the ear. So uh, in honor of uh, Francisco's devotion to this principle, I'm going to read Cancion. A dog I love growls at the sight of me, can no longer bear his diablos, crazed with the here, there, how, all around him the air howling. I sense temptation to dive into the void, glint of his coat, hint of a yelp, a blade to the throat. Unclench, I say, look. Your ghost father swims in your ghost mother. Opens his snout in your direction. The sound reaching you soothes your sleep, puts out the blaze in your head, is a quilt wrapped around you, unfurls down the path you tread, or flaps in the wind while you feed, keeps you company, though your spirit is still a fuse. You're muted. Thank you. <laughs> in 2010, the AWP Writers Conference was held in Denver, Colorado. As an AWP board member, I was tasked with hosting a dinner 
whose two guests of honor included Michael Nava. I have a confession to make. At the time, I had yet to read a single passage of a Henry Rios mystery. I say this with a degree of public embarrassment and a measure of guilt, for I had just published Glow of Our Sweat, my second book of poetry, and Michael had graciously provided a generous blurb. Truth be told, I don't remember how he first became aware of my work, but somehow he'd become a steadfast supporter for which I'd always been grateful, though in hindsight, not grateful enough. Dinner conversation that night included hearing about Michael's foray into judicial politics as he was attempting to be elected a judge in California in an effort to diversify the judiciary. When it was his turn to read from his work at the conference, he read this amazing vivid passage from his then forthcoming historical novel, The City of Palaces. I remember a scene where one of the characters, a transvestite, spends several minutes squeezing various parts of his body into his outfit. And yet, it wasn't until the publication last year of Carved in Bone that I finally made my foray into the universe of Henry Rios. I think the decisive factor was that the novel was set in my hometown of San Francisco the year I turned 18, 1984. As soon as I finished it, I wrote Michael an effusive email. And then one day, last March, at the onset of our pandemic lockdown, a friend in Memphis, out of the blue, over the phone, ventured out loud that he was looking to read a gay mystery novel. I casually mentioned Michael Nava, and that sealed it. For the next few months, we formed a phone book club of two and read, no, devoured Henry Rios. Lay Your Sleeping Head, which is an updated version of The Little Death, Golden Boy, How Town, the Hidden Law, The Death of Friends, The Burning May Plain, Rag and Bone, and again, the aforementioned Carved in Bone. Garth Greenwell in The New Yorker in 2015 begins his piece like this. In 1986, Michael Nava published The Little Death, a mystery novel featuring a detective unlike any previous protagonist in American noir. Gay and Latino from an immigrant family in California's Central Valley, Henry Rios is a defense attorney whose hard-boiled bona fides, world wariness, wit, a penchant for erotic entanglement, are accompanied by a hyper-attentiveness to class and a commitment to the poor. In a genre that have used queer people primarily as figures of ridicule and contempt, the Rios books offer a vista on gay lives extending from the closet-lined corridors of power to cruising parks and leather bars. What a ride it was, reading in rapid succession Michael Nava's books. I've even shipped a few Henry Rios mysteries to a friend in England, and he's devoured them as well. The phrase that occurs to me, beautifully written page turners. The first book I sent to England was Carved in Bone, an homage, an homage of sorts, as I've said, to my hometown. He has agreed to share an excerpt. Please welcome Michael Nava. Francisco, thank you for inviting me to participate in this launch of your beautiful book, and uh, to join this very distinguished group of poets. Um, I'm going to read this and then I'll say a few words about the poem I've asked you to read from after Ruben. San Francisco, November 1984. I sprinted up a dirt path covered with pine needles and brown leaves to one of the paved roads crisscrossing Buena Vista Park. 
Edging one side of the road was a stone retaining wall. In the gutter between wall and road were chunks of marble and granite, some bearing part of a date or a name. These were shards of gravestone salvaged from the cemeteries emptied at the end of the last century when the city had claimed their space for its growing population. I veered off the road onto another dirt path and galloped up wooden steps that led to the summit. On wobbly legs, I walked around a circle of grass where two couples, male and female, male and male, glanced at me for a moment before returning their attention to the view. Veterans Day, 1984. Ronald Reagan, just reelected president, said it was morning in America, but in San Francisco, where I shared the sidewalks with men who looked like the unburied dead, the morning was altogether different. As for me, still shaky three months out of rehab after nearly drinking myself to death, I often couldn't tell which moment my life had struck, morning or midnight. Through a break in the dark surrounding woods, the city unfurled itself below me. Low line, gray, dun, and pearl white buildings covered undulating hills beneath the achingly blue autumn sky. Just beyond the hilly neighborhoods, a single red orange tower pierced the heavy veil of incoming fog, the Golden Gate. A bird keened in the oaks above me, a foghorn moaned in the bay, the low swoosh of traffic drifted up from the streets. Wild roses splattered red blossoms on the hillside. The air was fragrant with the scent of leaves and earth and ocean. San Francisco at its most beguiling, the kind of view that either broke or mended hearts. As for me, suicidal drinking followed by bare knuckled sobriety had shattered my emotional gauges. I knew if I stood there one moment longer, I would burst into tears. So I jogged to another clearing where the woods blocked out the city. From there, I detected a few faint lines in the brush the park was a famous cruising ground for San Francisco's gay men. It was they who had made these trails as they stalked each other. On a beautiful sunny day like today, the park should have been buzzing with covert activity, but the woods were empty and still. Something else was stalking the city's gay men, a virus that bludgeoned them with grotesque diseases, leaving them blind, demented, and emaciated before it killed them. It passed from body to body in the naked intimacy of sex, so that while all of us were at risk, none of us knew for certain whether or not he carried it. I had never played in the park. The police sometimes raided the woods and I wasn't about to risk my law license for an outdoor blowjob. But I'd had sex in bathhouses and bedrooms all across the city. I assumed I was infected. Every morning I woke up and wondered whether this would be the day the virus struck. That anxiety lasted only until I called Larry Ross 10 minutes after I opened my eyes as he'd ordered me to when he became my AA sponsor five months earlier. He invariably opened our conversations with, have you, played, have you prayed yet? I don't believe in God, I told him the first time he, he posed this question. No, he replied. Well, then who rescued you from your apartment when you banged your head on the coffee table and were lying on the floor drunk and bleeding out? Well, that was my sister, I said. The sister you hadn't seen in three years who just happened to turn up that day. The apartment manager called her. She was my emergency contact. And why, Larry persisted, did the apartment manager choose that day to call her? It was a coincidence, I said. But he seized upon the trace of doubt in my voice. You're not sure of that. You think it may not have been a coincidence. And that doubt, Henry, that tiny shred of doubt that fragile belief that maybe something in the universe gives a fuck about your life and your well-being? Let's call that God, and you can pray to it. What am I supposed to say, I replied, sullen as a teenager. How about, help me and thank you? Fine, I said, and that had become my daily prayer. Help me and thank you. So, I actually began as a poet, and until I was in my early 20s, I only read and studied poetry um, with a series of poets that included Joseph Brodsky, who came to my college uh, for a few weeks. And um, 
one of the poets I discovered as an undergraduate was Ruben Darío, and I was mesmerized by his verse. And in particular, by a poem called Yo Persigo Una Forma, which was about the task that all writers have, the search that drives us forward, which is to find the perfect language, the perfect form, the container through which we can express those things which are deepest within us and which impel us to write. It's a mysterious and crepuscular poem, as mysterious as the act of creation itself. And I was so happy that, um, Francisco, that you chose to translate it and include it in your wonderful volume. And even more excited that you queered it by substituting David for Venus de Milo. So please read that for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. One of, the, one of the things about this book is that it includes a Spanish language appendix with the 10 original Rubindario poems that I render and riff in the English portion of the book at the front. So I will read in the original first, Yo persigo una forma. Yo persigo una forma que no encuentra mi estilo. Botón de pensamiento que busca ser la rosa. Se anuncia con un beso que en mis labios se posa al abrazo imposible de la Venus de Milo. Adornan verdes palmas el blanco perstilo. Los astros me han predicho la visión de la diosa. Y en mi alma reposa la luz como reposa el ave de la luna sobre un lago tranquilo. Y no hay yo sino la palabra que huye, la anización melódica que de la flauta fluye, y la barca del sueño que en el espacio boga. Y bajo la ventana de mi bella durmiente, el sollozo continuo del choro de la fuente, y el cuello del gran cisne blanco que me interroga. For the title, I just gave it a literal translation. I pursue a shape. I pursue a shape which to my style remains elusive, bud of a thought that wants to unfurl, that arrives with a kiss alighting on my lips, like being hugged by David. Columns are adorned with palms. Stars say I will glimpse a god. And light descends, settling inside me, like the bird of the moon settling on a still lake. And yet all I obtain our words wanting to scurry away, melodious prelude streaming from a flute, boat of dreams rowing through space, and outside his window, the fountain's spout continues to weep, the swan's neck posing the question. Thank you all for joining us this evening. We're all going to come up and uh, say good evening. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for, for joining me tonight. And thank you all out there for attending this event. Uh, don't forget to vote next Tuesday. <laughs> And uh, that's all we have for tonight. So uh, good night. Buenas noches. Gracias. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Gracias. Thank Pleasure you for you. watching. Thank you. Thank those you. of you who added your, uh, your <laughs> yeah. hands out there, your little manitos. Thank you out there. <laughs> Thank Carl. You. <laughs>
<laughs> hey, Ma, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Francisco, for inviting us. Thank you. <laughs> yep. <laughs>